So I just wanted to uh, welcome everyone uh, and to um, take this opportunity to thank the philosophy program and its current EO, Jonathan Gilmore, for supporting the, this lecture. Uh, this is our 28th, no, it's more, 27, I think. Yeah, one of those two. So uh, with a very illustrious uh, list um, and uh, we're really delighted to um, add uh, Greg Horowitz to that um, to that list. I wanted to say uh, that Mark Swartowski, as you may know, was a professor here and at Baruch, a distinguished professor of philosophy uh, for many years after serving at Boston University as um, chair of the department and professor of philosophy there. Um, his interests were very broad, um, including stretching from philosophy of science through aesthetics to the philosophy of medicine, the philosophy of technology, uh, developmental psychology, and Marxism. Yeah. Did I leave that? I'm looking at Michael Gulvartowski, who has been an important um, source of mm, enlightenment, carrying on the tradition and support for me, at least. And um, he and I have just finished, finally, after all these years, uh, the collection of uh, Marx's mostly posthumous work, including some of his hard to find published pieces. And we're excited to have those in manuscript form. And we hope that they will be published sometime soon, um, including some of his fantastic philosophical cartoons. Those of you who've suffered through my seminars here know that I require you to come up with cartoons to illustrate your presentations, or at least graphics, especially for some of the subjects about violence and so forth that are too hard and not very funny. Um, so um, with that said, um, I want to introduce our speaker. And this is um, uh, my honor to have one of Marx's um, best students. He had so many good ones, but very accomplished, very distinguished uh, student. And um, Greg Horowitz taught for many, well, you worked with Peter Kidney and with Marx mm -hmm. on your uh, dissertation. And he also exemplifies the kind of breadth of interests that, we're, that we try to carry on with this lecture in Marx's honor, uh, combining a concern with um, with aesthetics, with social critique, with, and the range of, um, I was looking at your CV and the range of students that he supervised at Vanderbilt, where he taught for many years, is just amazing on the topics. The number of courses, the diversity. So perfectly qualified uh, for this um, lecture. Um, you don't have to qualify. We're lucky to have you. <laughs> so um, Greg, uh, more recently, after serving at Vanderbilt um, for many years, uh, he moved to Pratt Institute, uh, where he was professor of philosophy and chair of social science and cultural studies in New York, uh, and um, I think is now emeritus from, from Pratt. Um, he, when he was there, he contributed to rethinking the structure of the liberal education of artists and designers. And he developed uh, graduate courses in critical cultural theory um, that draw on academic and studio resources. Um, he has published um, uh, books and articles. And just to give you a flavoring, uh, he has a book uh, from 2001 uh, called Sustaining Loss, <clears throat> Art and Mournful Life. Hopefully today's talk will be cheerier Absolutely. for all of us hoarders. We're all hoarders of one thing, or at least I am, books. I'm, I'm, here, to, to, I'm here to praise you. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll take it. I think there are 6,000 in this one small New York City apartment. It's crazy. Um, and then he also edited with Thomas Hume, uh, The Wake of Art, Criticism, Philosophy, and the Ends of Taste. And he's published innumerable essays and articles one of which I would call to your attention, it was called Art as Objective Praxis, <clears throat> which was published in a collection that I edited called Constructivism and Practice, Developing a Social and Historical Epistemology, which included uh, some uh, works um, that came out of a conference on Mark Swartowski's work. Um, 
So I'm um, just really excited to hear your take on with that provocative title, which we all want to understand what you could possibly be talking about. <laughs> I should also say that this, um, for those who may be just visiting and not familiar with things, this the lecture will be followed with a Q a Q and A that Michael Brownstein will organize as part of the regular philosophy colloquium series, and then we have a, a special reception in the philosophy lounge on the seventh floor to which you're all invited. It has extra special items because this is a collaboration or is co-sponsored by the Center for Global Ethics and Politics that I direct at the Graduate Center, um, and it kind of falls within our. Uh, remit because it has the word capitalism in it, in the abstract. So, um, okay. Thank you, Greg, for coming. I'm Thank really you. delighted. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Carol, thank you for the introduction. I should say, Carol pointed out that uh, Marx was my uh, dissertation supervisor. I did work with Peter as well. But I moved to Rutgers after having finished my most of my work at BU, thanks to John Silver, um, and and um, <laughs> and Peter Kibbe was gracious enough to let Marx be my leading critic on the on the dissertation project. So I consider myself Marx's student. That being said, I knew you before I knew Marx. Do you oh, not remember this? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, at Sarah Lawrence, right. I was an undergraduate at Sarah Lawrence. My mentor took ill and you filled in in the class. It was memorable. You don't remember me, but thank you. <laughs> what else are you gonna say? Um, I did, I always talked a lot. Um, so, so before I begin, I wanna thank the Center for Global Ethics and Politics, thank the philosophy department, particular thank Carol, thank Michael for organizing this, and also thank you for being here, Michael. It's, um, I, I don't know how many people here had the privilege of knowing Marx, I hope many, um, a fantastic person. I, I, I don't know how much of him is in me, but it's a lot, I'm sure. Um, the one thing that I was thinking about most while writing this paper is Marx is the one who really taught me how to think dialectically. And I don't mean anything fancy by that. What I mean is he was able to turn every yes, but into an and also, right? So thinking kept going. And I think that's in me deeper than I will, than I will ever know. Um, and it's lovely to have you here because I'm sure people have said this to you, but you look like your dad. So it's nice to have you looking at me today. Um, Okay, so um, I'm here to praise hoarding. Um, Lydia already pointed out, by the way, that there's an ambiguity in the first slide. It says, in praise of hoarding, Greg Hurwitz. <laughs> um, and I'm pretty sure that by the end of today, you will have had your fill of me. So no, no danger there. Um, so I'm just gonna, gonna begin. In her book, The Female Malady, the literary critic and historian Elaine Showalter refers to the last quarter of the 19th century as the golden age of hysteria. Over the course of those 25 years, Showalter observes, hysteria went from being a rare diagnosis with no settled criteria to distinguish it from what was commonly called malingering to the most frequently diagnosed illness in the psychiatric wards of Europe. While the concept of hysteria in its narrow medical sense and hence also the medical condition it names are visible to us now only in the rear view mirror, we currently find ourselves living in another golden age, this time of obsessive compulsive hoarding disorder, um, which I will call OCHD or hoarding disorder indifferently during the course of the talk. It was only in 2013 that OCHD entered the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the American Psychiatric Association's periodically revised authoritative classification of mental and emotional illnesses. OCAD, OCHD attained its official status by being controversially distinguished from OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, in the years between the publication of the DSM-IV DSM revised 
in 2000 and the DSM-5 in 2013. Yet even though OCHD is a recently recognized disease, the American Psychiatric Association now estimates that between two and 6% of Americans suffer from it to some degree. Please ponder that statistic for a moment. Less than 20 years ago, less than 20 years ago, there was no consensus among clinicians and research psychiatrists that OCHD named a condition. And now they judge that there are as many as 16 million cases of it in the United States alone. Extrapolate that to the global scale, as some academic psychiatrists have done, and we get a rough estimate of 400, as many as 480 million clinically diagnosable hoardings worldwide. Now, Showalter, along with philosophers and historians of ideas such as Michel Foucault, Gary Greenberg, Ian Hacking, some of you in this room may know some and not others on that list, they've taught us to ask hard questions about the invention and institutionalization of psychiatric concepts. In that spirit, we might be skeptical that this army of magpies could simply have gone unnoticed until recently, and then ask, are we living through an epidemic of OCHD, or has a viral overuse of the concept driven, driven the construction of hoarding behavior as an illness? I think it's some of both. That'll be one of the themes in the paper. Still, some of the reflexive skepticism about psychiatric concepts might be deflated by keeping in mind that psychiatric concepts and perhaps medical concepts more broadly are by nature conjectural and subject to revision. They are illness models, updated or discarded as necessary, with which psychiatrists and psychologists make sense of the otherwise confounding cognitive, affective, and behavioral presentations, characteristic of mental illness. In this light, it's worth spending a little time considering a conspicuous feature of the history of mental illness models, that is, that the bits and pieces of what come to be understood later as distinctively identifiable psychiatric disorders, um, they're intrusive and puzzling. They're, the, they're intrusive and puzzling, which is to say they're aggressively noticeable, emotionally and cognitively, long before they're organized under medical headings as symptoms of an underlying disease. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, to take that instance now, which is one of the two most common, I'm gonna call them diseases of memory, that has a long and well-studied prehistory. It was apprehended medically under names like soldier's heart, shell shock, and war neurosis, in each case with different features of what we now call PTSD given prominence. Deeper in its history, the disturbance of sleep characteristic of PTSD was described with precision. I almost want to ask Paul to recite this for me. Described with precision by Shakespeare in Mercutio's famous speech in Romeo and Juliet about Queen Mab, charioteer and midwife of fairies who works on our dreams. From that Queen Mab speech, sometimes she driveth o'er a soldier's neck and then dreams he of cutting foreign throats, of breeches, ambuscados, Spanish blades, of health's five fathom deep, and then anon drums in his ear, at which he starts and wakes, and being thus frighted, swears a prayer or two, and sleeps again. So it's what we might call a flashback. The other most common disease of memory is depression, about which the National Institutes of Health's National Library of Medicine says, there is no objective testing available to diagnose depression. Individuals with depression often present to their primary care physicians for somatic complaints stemming from depression rather than seeing a mental health professional. In almost half of the cases, patients deny having depressive feelings and they're often brought for treatment by the family or sent by an employer to be evaluated for social withdrawal and decreased activity. Now, as the NIH's guidance underscores, the link between long familiar states of the soul, such as social withdrawal and loss of interest in life, the link between those and underlying disease is often invisible to those who are depressed. 
Note to the NIH's subtle implication that the link between symptoms and disease is sometimes also opaque to primary care physicians. It's therefore unsurprising that the prehistory of the category major depressive or disorder is rich with discarded nosological concepts, disordered humors, partial insanity, melancholia, and so on, that to our eyes approximate more or less to the disease as we now understand it. That these earlier concepts were all oriented toward the same instrumental goals as modern psychiatry may be a Whiggish illusion, but it's undeniable that what we now think of as affective, cognitive, and behavioral symptoms of major depressive disorder were identified as disordered memory well before the illness earned its current name. The fact that the symptoms of PTSD and depression are not merely artifacts of psychiatric concepts, but keys to understanding long acknowledged conditions might help take some of the edge off of our skepticism about the legitimacy of these psychiatric concepts. They're not just inventions. Okay. It's a bit of background. Unfortunately for the skeptic, for the, sorry, unfortunately for the anti-skeptic, the condition or the symptoms, if you prefer, of hoarding disorder and the medical concept of it were born more or less simultaneously. The leading cognitive, affective, and behavioral symptoms of OCHD are compulsive accumulation of things with no apparent regard for their value, difficulty distinguishing between valuable and worthless things, anxiety about discarding what to others seem to be worthless possessions, and impairment of other domestic, social, and psychological functions in virtue of gratifying the compulsion to gather and preserve. I'll talk a little bit more about how these criteria work later, but this apposition of conditions appears nowhere before the middle of the 19th century. Nowhere. To be sure, there are long recognized disorders of the soul to which OCHD might at first glance seem related, miserliness and greed, for instance, or in a more minor key, slavishness. But they were regarded in earlier eras, not as medical, but as moral disorders. And in any case, as I will, I think, show, at least argue, they're not properly thought of as characteristics of OCHD at all. There is, in short, no obvious behavioral or conceptual prehistory of OCHD. It's a disease entirely of the present moment. Now, the cultural historian Rebecca Kalkoff has identified one candidate predecessor to compulsive hoarding. Wait for it that predates OCHD, albeit only marginally, and that did in fact attract medical attention, namely bibliomania. <laughs> bibliomania. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm looking at everyone. <laughs> this concept was coined by the Scottish doctor John Ferrier in his poem of 1809, The Bibliomania, not the bibliomaniac, the bibliomania, which begins with the lines, what wild desires, what restless torments sees the hapless man who feels the book disease. Mm -hmm. The pathologizing of book hoarding was quickly taken up and popularized by the Reverend Thomas Frognall Dibden in his 1809 book, Bibliomania or Book Madness. In 1874, Benjamin Thomas in a memoir described in a memoir, described his grandfather, Isaiah Thomas, who was the founder of the American Antiquarian Society, mm -hmm. um, described him as suffering from the gentlest of, gentlest of infirmities, although to emphasize its gentleness, as well, of course, as his grandfather's gentility, Thomas called his grandfather's condition not bibliomania, but bibliophilia. The distinction between hoarding and collecting is something we might want to discuss later, but that there were cases of pathological bibliomania in the 19th century is undeniable. Sir Thomas Phillips hoarded approximately 40,000 books and 60,000 manuscripts over his lifetime, and was said to have had the ambition to own a copy of every book ever published, which I just want to say, it's an absurd 
To us now, it's an utterly absurd idea. It was absurd in the 19th century, but not as absurd as it, as it would be now. No one knows the exact size of Philip's hoard. In fact, after he died, it took roughly 70 years to churn it back in to circulation. So nobody knows the exact size of Philip's hoard for reasons made vivid by Sir Frederick Madden, keeper of manuscripts at the British Museum, after a visit to Philip's estate at Middle Hill. And I quote from Madden, the house looks more miserable and dilapidated every time I visit. And there's not a room now that is not crowded with large boxes full of manuscripts. The state of things is really inconceivable. Lady P is absent, and were I in her place, I would never return to so wretched an abode. Every room is filled with heaps of papers, manuscripts, books, charters, packages, and other things, lying in heaps under your feet, piled upon tables, beds, chairs, ladders, etc., etc., and in every room piles of huge boxes up to the ceiling containing the more valuable volumes. It is quite sickening. The windows of the house are never open, and the and the close, confined air and smell of the paper and manuscripts is almost unbearable. This is a guy who's a lover of manuscripts. This is plainly a case of what we would now call OCHD. It matches in many details, I want to observe, the description of hoarding that we find in Bleak House, the Charles Dickens novel of 1852. In the voice of the rag and bone shop proprietor, Crook, Dickens writes, you see, I have so many things here of so many kinds, and all as the neighbors think, but they know nothing, wasting away and going to rack and ruin. And I have so many old parchments and papers in my stock, and I have a liking for rust and must and cobwebs, and all's fish that comes to my net. And I can't bear to part with anything I once lay hold of, or so my neighbors think, but what do they know? Or to alter anything or to have any sweeping, nor scouring, nor cleaning, nor repairing going on about me. That's the way I've got the ill name of chancery, right? Because, of course, Brooks Hoard ends up playing a role in the legal case that goes on and on and on in Bleak House. Turns out he has important papers, but what do they know? There may be an element, some element of miserliness in Crook's disposition. But at base, he and Phillips both suffer from an aggressive unwillingness, which others describe with distaste. I just have to add, but what do they know? Which others describe with dis distaste as an inability to distinguish the useful from the useless, the valuable from the worthless. This unwillingness or inability is at the core of OCHD. I'll soon expand on this claim. I'm going to turn to the logic of compulsive supporting in just a moment. I'll, I'll soon expand on this claim, but I pause here to note um, how it may, may help to explain Kalkoff's observation that bibliomania represents a predecessor to, or perhaps the first appearance of hoarding disorder. In the context of what is generally and suggestively called printed matter, two forms of value can be distinguished. The value of the text, which can be extracted from its particular embodiments, and the value of those embodiments. The mass production of printed matter, the mass production of print, and increasingly cheap matter, or more generally of meaning, and the material bearer it tendentially renders worthless, ignites an uncanny contest of values. We might remember here Wittgenstein's claim in the private language argument that using memory to confirm a private extensive definition would be, quote, as if someone were to buy several copies of the morning newspaper to assure himself that what it said was true. <laughs> the, the absurdity of that rests on this radical distinction of value. Wittgenstein's analogy works only on the presumption that the value of the individual copy of the newspaper is exhausted in its being the bearer of a text, leaving the multiplicity of instances to be a matter of contempt or indifference. The hoarder, by contrast, refuses the counsel of indifference by refusing to judge or being unable to judge anything to be eternally worthless. This tangled relation of meaning and apparently worthless matter 
guides me in my next section, and I'll return to it thematically in my conclusion. So now I'm going to turn to the logic of compulsive hoarding itself. Some of us, I mean, it's, it's a thing, it's a thing. Some of us are familiar with hoarding from personal experience, but many more, I think, are familiar with it from reality television shows, such as The Hoarders, Inside Hoarding, and my favorite hoarding, Buried Alive. <laughs> now, since the stock and trade of reality TV is the revelation of the shocking reality behind mundane lives, the appeal of shows dedicated to the chaos hidden within ordinary homes is hardly surprising. What is somewhat surprising is that hoarding shows are not on HGTV. Since those who suffer from OCHD are dogged interior decorators. <laughs> Hoarders care more than most of us about the contents of their homes, which they tend with energy and dedication. Hoarding may look to non-hoarders like a plague of randomness, in fact, the everyday German expression for it is messy syndrome, not a medical concept, but the everyday concept. But the mess is all in the eye of the beholder. Talking with hoarders reveals that they have intelligible principles of order, but because they also have a compulsion to display, those principles of order are hard for non-hoarders to spot. And the dialectic I'm gonna unfold over the next sweep of argument is about the relationship between saving and showing. Okay. The psychologist Fred Penzel calls the rich landholder Stepan Plushkin in Dead Souls, Nikolai Gogol's novel of 1842, calls him the first hoarder in literature. Gogol writes, and I'm just gonna abbreviate this, after Plushkin, there was no need to sweep the streets. If a passing officer happened to lose a spur, the spur would immediately be dispatched to the famous pile. If a woman started mooning by the well and forgot her bucket, he would carry off the bucket. Gogol adds more and more items to the list to convey the sublimity of Pliushkin's hoard by means of what Umberto Eco has called the poetics of etc. Um, and you may have noticed that the, let's call it the prosaics of etc. was at work in, in Madden's report on, um, on Philip's hoard. Um, Gogol's Plyushkin, in whose honor, by the way, OCHD is called in colloquial Russian, this I only know secondhand, Plyushkin syndrome. He sounds like crook, for whose net all is fish. But Gogol concludes his description by singling out for attention a feature of Plyushkin's behavior that is distinct from unbound accumulation. Here's what Gogol writes. In his room, he picked up whatever he saw on the floor, a bit of sealing wax, a scrap of paper, a feather, and put it all on the bureau or the windowsill. Now, Gogol does not rationalize Plyushkin's impulse to display his hoard by adding that he has run out of storage space, however likely that, that may be. Plyushkin chooses not to squirrel his hoard away, but rather in an act that treats trash as treasure, puts his fresh supplements to it in plain sight. Indeed, one of the distinctive habits of compulsive hoarders is to stack their possessions atop their dressers and chests while leaving the drawers empty. In this respect, hoarders are not simply dogged decorators, but crazed curators driven in contrast to run-of-the-mill pack rats to display their collections. For hoarders, the acknowledgement of the value of their possessions is somehow incompatible with storing them out of sight. We might say that the apparent disorder, disorder of the hoard rests on the hoarder's extreme estimation, which I've done nothing to explain so far, extreme estimation of the significance of seeing it. It's as if hoarders misunderstand the nature of property. 
One owns property in virtue of a socio-legal convention that binds a possession to you. But compulsive hoarders, like children and aristocrats, don't trust this abstraction. Hysteria, it has been argued, was a theatrical disease. It's in Charcot's clinic, the center of um, hysterical diagnosis. Hysteria, it has been argued, was a theatrical disease in the sense that the hysteric performed her suffering through the staged presentation of her helpless body. OCHD, by contrast, is a visual art disease. The compulsive hoarder's illness is on display in her installations. Indeed, the importance to OCHD of the presence of possessions near at hand is the way I want to put it, but which is to say of their visibility, is expressed throughout the diagnostic criteria offered by the DSM-5. Yeah, whoop, go back. Oh, how's the weather? Here we go. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. So, um, the importance to OCHD of the presence of possessions near at hand, which save their visibility, is expressed throughout the diagnostic criteria offered by the DSM-5 in terms of the systematic unwillingness to discard, which means in aesthetic terms, the inability to let anything escape from the picture. And I just wanna, without going through it, just call your attention to the fact that the difficulty of discarding, the distress associated with discarding, that shows up in a prominent place in the first three diagnostic criteria. Um, okay. What distinguishes OCHD, hoarding disorder, from OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, is that the element of obsession is lacking in OCHD, right? The stuff's there. The element of obsession is lacking. Now, in the face of the hoarder's ceaseless accumulation and difficulty, and difficulty discarding, this may seem like a weird thing to say. But according to psychologist Randy Frost, one of the leading advocates of the diagnostic specificity of OCHD, OCHD, OCHD lacks the element of anxiety that's a defining feature of obsession. Hence the now common designation of OCHD just as hoarding disorder. The obsessive part of it has dropped away. So to spell, spell this out a little bit. Episodes of obsessive compulsive disorder, which can swallow up hours and days of a sufferer's life, typically begin with an intrusive thought about contamination or invasion or injury that is dangerous sometimes to oneself, but often to others. To silence the intrusive thought, the obsessive compulsive is, is compelled to engage in rituals of avoidance, such as repeated hand washing, checking over and over again that the gas is turned off, or speaking a special sequence of words in an exact order. These compulsive magical rituals are anxious efforts to banish anxiety, hence the name OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Now notably, nowhere in the cycle of intrusion, defense, and purgation is there anything egocentric? Nothing uh, affirmative. The best that can be hoped for is relief from obsessive thoughts and a return to the status quo ante. Now, some behaviors characteristic of OCD can also be found in OCHD, such as a kind of ritualistic inflexibility about proper arrangement, but these are only surface similarities. A fundamental difference between hoarders and obsessive compulsives is that hoarders do not feel anxiety when engaging in their compulsive behavior, but only when someone stops them from doing so. As the Mayo Clinic says on its website, people with hoarding disorder may not see it as a problem. So getting them to take part in treatment can be challenging. 
Now, insofar as the aim of treatment is to stop someone from doing something, this claim is almost tautological. Right? I'm fine. Hoarders feel compelled to buy, scavenge, and save, but it's only inhibiting them from doing so that causes anxiety. This is what's at stake in DSM-5's criteria B and C. Intervention in the hoarder's activity, that's what causes psychological distress. Giving in to the compulsion, however, is wholly gratifying. Discussing Diogenes syndrome, which is a name used mostly by European psychiatrists to describe hoarding by the elderly or senile. I guess we don't say senile anymore, those who suffer from um, age dementias. So describing Diogenes syndrome, the psychiatrist Joao Gama Marquez writes, quote, Diogenes syndrome is not a specific disease, but a real neuropsychiatric syndrome characterized by severe domestic squalor, pathological hoarding, lack of insight, and number four, no need for help. Not needing help is part of the disease. Extraordinary thing to say. Not, they don't believe they need help. They don't need help. People with OCD suffer from a compulsion to control their impulsive thoughts. People with OCHD suffer a compulsive lack of impulse control. Because OCHD is in this light a disease not of anxiety, but of pleasure, it's no surprise that sufferers from it are not in any need of help. What then is the connection in OCH in hoarding disorder between the compulsion to save the mass of possessions and the compulsion to display them? I left that hanging. An easy answer to this question would be that since every item in a hoarder's collection is a token of pleasure, that is of an impulse gratified, discarding any of them would lead to a feeling of loss. Right? Who wants to get rid of the stuff that reminds them of happy times? The visible hoard, from this point of view, would be a vouchsafe against some kind of threat of desolation and mourning which would make OCHD, like PTSD and depression, a kind of disease of memory. But this interpretation cannot be right as it stands. The relationship between a need, the object that fulfills it, and the feeling of gratification, typically, I say typically because I don't have a theory of this exactly, but typically depends on the use of the object. Orders, however, are no more able to use their hoard than to discard it. In fact, using things is simply a way of discarding them, which is why hoarders so often leave what they acquire in their original packet. And, and for the bibliomaniacs in the room, you may remember, I mean, this in fact has become a universal habit now. We leave books in their wrappers. We call them book jackets, right? But they're just the wrappers they came in. <laughs> One of the more insalubrious kinds of accumulation indulged in by some sufferers of hoarding disorder is hoarding food, sometimes far beyond the date at which it's safe to eat it. Now, patently, patently, an abundance of uneaten and now inedible food is a hoard of what hasn't gratified a hunger. It represents not the memory of gratification, but of gratification foregone. This is paradoxical though, since it suggests that even if the hoard is the consequence of a lack of impulse control, its accumulation is visible testament to the restraint of impulse. This can't be right. Resolving this paradoxical relation between the lack of impulse control and resistance to gratifying use of the hoard is I think the key to understanding the logic of compulsive hoarding. So following Frost again, who proposes that what hoarders hoard is not stuff, but opportunities, let me say that hoarders take pleasure neither in consumption, they're not gluttons, nor in foregoing consumption, they're plainly not ascetics. 
but in the anticipation of future consumption. Recall my epigraph from the novelist Olga Tokarczyk, everyone knows the profit to be reaped from the useful, but nobody knows the benefit to be gained from the useless. I think hoarders take this epistemic prohibition literally when they decide, as it were, to wait and see what benefits might come from what now seem worthless things. The hoard is a promise of unforeseen happiness, unbound by norms of present consumption, unbound even by every available satiety. I want to say, in, in a sense, this is a topic for another day, the hoarder is really a kind of aesthetic connoisseur. Right? And I think there's a book to be written called The Psychoaesthetics of Everyday Life. The hoarder would be the leading figure in this book. So we can zero in on the specificity of the hoarder's orientation to future happiness by picking up on a theme I left hanging earlier. The, the avidity with which hoarders value accumulation over use, it might remind us at first of misers who refuse to let anyone consume a share of what they own. Like misers, hoarders are zealots. And on some theories of hoarding disorder, walling themselves off from other people's claims is one of their goals, right? So you can imagine it's a characteristic problem for hoarders that it's kind of hard to let other people into their houses. They can hardly make it into their houses, so. Um, but unlike misers, Hoarder, hoarders are not typically what you would call selfish. While they cannot, without distress, throw anything away, this is a real peculiarity, they are frequently very happy gift givers. Right? I had a grandmother who used to open bank accounts every three months, $100, you got a free toaster. <laughs> She didn't need all those toasters, but she was always looking for the chance to give them as a gift, right? So frequently happy gift givers. Sorry for the young folks in the room, this whole idea is preposterous, but some of us remember this, right? Um, so um, they're frequently happy gift givers. Unlike misers then, they're not hostile to the circulation of their riches, but only to the discarding of them. That means there is for hoarders a kind of circulation of goods that's not identical to the dissipation of the hoard. Although I know of no studies at all um, that directly support what I'm about to say, directly support this inference, hoarders seem able to give away things that they've withdrawn from the everyday cycle of purchase, scavenge, use, and scrap if they can imagine those gifts, them being kept withdrawn again from that cycle by the recipient as well. Indeed, hoarders often add to their hoard based on the belief that the item will be of interest to someone else. I'll talk about that in a moment at the end of this section. Based, that is, on their perception of its gift value. This makes the hoarder not a miser at all, but I want to say a custodian and perhaps even a kind of altruist. A strange kind of altruist, of course, since what the hoarder aims to serve directly is not the needs of actually existing people, but the future of things. It's what, what it's somewhere between a custodian and an altruist. And other people are served only when they're imaginatively recruited into the service of further accumulation for the sake of the future. Perhaps we shouldn't call this altruism at all, since the, that concept commonly signifies direct and selfless regard for the well-being of others. But I'm not sure that there is a common concept that picks out the virtue of generalized, selfless, and impersonal regard for the promise of future happiness embodied in everything in the world. Don't think we have a concept for that. We lack a means to understand that hoarders are kind of, they're, they're saints of hedonism, who stockpile, saints of hedonism, who stockpile disinterestedly on behalf of us all. 
But because they hoard the future, hoarders must pay the price of a selfless, which is another way of saying limitless disregard for life unfolding in the present moment. Okay. From this point of view, the hoarder is in the grip of a utopian vision of the world as a mass of unbroken promises. It may be that hoarders somehow sense the hollowness of the promises, for they seem not to be moved to check if the promises can be kept. It isn't that they bought the hundredth set of bed sheets because the first 99 were scratchy or ill-fitting or in some other way defective. No promise needs to be actually fulfilled and therefore no disappointment needs to be finally endured. Perhaps that sounds a touch overstated, but in any case, compulsive hoarders are clearly less susceptible to give credence to the pledge of commodities than those of us who buy them because we think they'll make us happy today. That's not the impulse to buy. And yet they continue, they continue to amass in a single hoard, plainly useful, plainly to us, useful commodities, along with, to us, heaps of garbage. With this in mind, I think, we can unravel the antinomy of hoarding. Hoarding cleaves apart the two very different meanings embedded in the concept of the consumer. And by the way, this I'm not gonna spell this out at great length, but one of the reasons I think hoarding is a modern phenomenon and concept is it depends on this idea, this bivalent idea of consumption. Um, hoarding cleaves apart the two very different meanings embedded in the concept of the consumer. On one hand, a consumer is a buyer of commodities. That's the sense that matters when you read the business pages of the newspaper. Nobody cares what you do with the commodities. What they care is that you buy them. So a consumer is a buyer of commodities. And on the other, a user of commodities. Hoarders buy, but they don't use. This is why hoarding, I think, looks uncanny to us. It makes visible that use value, what we would get when we consume, use value is now a mere excuse for participating in consumer capitalism. Whether sufferers from hoarding disorder are conscious of any ambivalence about the allure of commodities is something we will never glean from their testimony alone because when called to account for their habits, Orders simply deny that the appearance of anything's current worthlessness is a reason to throw it away. Anything. This will inevitably seem to non-hoarders to be a deficit of rationality. Right? If it looks worthless, doesn't that just mean it should be tossed? This will seem to non-hoarders like a deficit of rationality. I'm going to conclude my discussion of the logic of compulsive hoarding by defending the hoarder against this charge. Okay, here we go. I love this argument. I don't think it can be right, but I love this argument. Okay. Okay. One of the most extraordinary behaviors characteristic of, of hoarding, but sorry, put it differently. One of the most um, extraordinary aspects of hoarding behavior and cognition is what theorists and therapists call churning. Now, Irene, Frost's specimen patient in his book, Stuff, colon, Compulsive Hoarding and the Meaning of Things, Irene has agreed to be treated because she complains. She spends hours every day trying to clean out her house. Frost comes to Irene's house and sees that stacks of things cover every surface in the house. And please keep in mind what I said earlier, that the hoarder's compulsion, about the hoarder's compulsion to display, Irene sees surfaces where those of us with more miserly metaphysics do not. Pans turned upside down, cushionless sofas, the cushions themselves already haven't been recruited as independent surfaces. Everything is a surface suitable for display. However hard she tries, Irene's piles never shrink. That's why she's allowed the psychologist into the house. 
Puzzled, Frost asks her to show him her process of sorting out the valuable possessions from the scrap. From atop one of the stacks, Irene picks up a piece of paper. It's a months old newspaper clipping about drug use among teenagers that she explains she means to give to her daughter. But as her daughter is away at college at the moment, Irene puts the clipping down atop a nearby stack, explaining to Frost that keeping it on the top where she can see it will remind, it to get, remind her to give it to her daughter next time she's home from college. Back to the first stack now. Beneath where the newspaper clipping once was, Irene finds a promotional mailer from a phone company. She'd saved it, she explains, because it promised her cheaper rates, but she hasn't yet had time to pursue the opportunity. She places it where else? On top of the newspaper clipping, also to be returned to later. We can see where this is going. By the time Irene gets to the bottom of the stack she's working on, She's done nothing but invert it, top to bottom. She undertakes the task with the express purpose of separating out the wheat from the chaff, but in the end, everything is saved. However, what's most amazing about churning is not simply that the stated reason for undertaking the task of making distinctions between the useful and the worthless, that it's defeated, but that what defeats it is another process of reasoning. Irene is making a purposive decision about every item she handles, but whatever her test of value, everything passes it. Frost calls this a problem with decision-making, which is rather an understatement. It is, however, hardly a problem of indecisiveness. It is instead a problem of too much decision-making. Not too little, it's too much decision-making. Irene is nothing if she isn't a thinker. Indeed, she's a virtuoso at perceiving future value to which others are blind. When she picks up a plastic cap from a long lost pen, she churns it back into the hoard because it may be useful as a piece in a board game. Frost finds himself forced into a grudging admiration for her. He writes, the physical world of hoarders is different and much more expansive than for the rest of us. Now, Frost's way of putting this seems to me right. Still, it doesn't get to the heart of Irene's trouble, since the expansiveness of her world is also the restriction of her life. Wherever Irene turns, things worth saving are in plain sight. Her rational decisions to save everything express an undifferentiated messianic love to which she is bound. To not discriminate the worthwhile from the contemptible, is to experience a world exuding positive value from every poor, a world that for just that reason is uninhabitable. A mixture of what seemed to me both worthless and valuable things, says Frost, was to Irene a collection of equally valuable items. In other words, orders are radical egalitarians. This is the moment then to recall the original I didn't put that line in for you, but I was hoping you'd make that face. They're radical egalitarians. This is the moment then to recall the original pre-capitalist meaning of the word hoard. And we can still hear the echo of this in the current use. It simply meant a treasure, just a treasure. It's not that hoarders refuse to judge, they're not indifferent, but for them, every camel makes its way through the eye of the needle. They're egalitarian treasurers, for whom widely shared perceptions of disvalue provide no reason to stop treasuring. They're therefore fated to embody the conflict between norms of value, whatever your norms of value, and the messy superabundance of the world. To refuse the ready-made distinctions between the dispensable and the indispensable is to think too much of the future and therefore to be at odds with others, which is to say, Hoarding as a form of social suffering. Okay. Last section. This is, um, yeah. So my last few minutes, I aim to make good on my promise to praise hoarding. Some of you may already have noticed that um, in my title, I distort the name of the text from which it's borrowed. 
Um, Erasmus called his book, The Praise of Folly, to exploit the double genitive. The praise of folly is delivered by the character Folly himself, with all the liberties that that entails. It would not be impossible for me to construct my praise of hoarding as a hoarder's self-praise. That, however, would require too much further philosophical reflection for this afternoon. So instead, I'm going to conclude in a non-Erasmian manner by breaking my praise into two discrete parts, a defense of the hoarder and praise proper of hoarding. The question will, of course, remain on the table whether my defense of the hoarder is also self-defense. Now, the basis of my defense of hoarding, I think, should be clear by now. It is, in essence, an effort to protect hoarders from the psychiatrists by raising doubts about the appropriateness of treating hoarding as a disease. The near comic difficulty that clinicians have encountered in trying to create assessment schedules for the differential diagnosis of hoarding disorder makes vivid that the distinctive qualities of the pathological relation to the flood of stuff generated by consumer capitalism, this can't be settled by narrow medical criteria alone. In what follows, I'll be too hard on doctors, but I wanna say they are merely the frontline soldiers of good conscience in a helpless social mobilization against hoarding. But my praise for the hoarder can gain lift only if we can come to see that the hoarders are themselves our agents in, the sp in a space of disorder that has arisen in the borderlands between order and disorder. Now, earlier I claimed that hoarding is a case not of individual, but of social suffering, aiming thereby to, hi to highlight the impossibility of distinguishing the anguish of the hoarder, which I've argued is not intrinsic to the activity itself, from its social contexts. This, difficult this difficulty matters because medical scrutiny properly begins when someone comes before a doctor because they're having life difficulties. Right? We all, you know, when a friend starts to psychoanalyze us over drinks, we say, back off. Right? I didn't bring myself before you for that. Um, the anguish of hoarding, however, is not the hoarders, or at least not the hoarders alone. Recall the DSM's criterion C for diagnosing hoarding disorder. The difficulty discarding possessions results in the accumulation of possessions that congest and clutter active living areas and substantially compromise their intended use. If living areas are uncluttered, it is only because of the interventions of third parties, family members, cleaners, authorities. Decluttering happens only when family members, etc., intervene because the hoarder is unwilling or unable to do it, but also because it's they, not the hoarder, who are directly bothered by it. The hoarder does not suffer the clutter, but rather causes others to suffer. From the medical point of view, however, that means that it's the wrong party who's present before the doctor. The, this, problem pops, this problem pops up repeatedly in the clinical literature on hoarding disorders, as in the following 2014 summary of the state of research, a, a, one, of, one of many. Many hoarding patients have poor insight into the disorder and seem unaware of how much it has negatively impacted their lives. Further, for certain individuals, Hoarding behavior may be egocentric, meaning that they have a positive attitude toward their possessions and their hoarding behavior and are reluctant to engage in treatment. Frost and Gross, Frost and Gross found that many hoarding participants thought that their behavior was not problematic or only sometimes found it problematic. The authors noted that these participants described their hoarding as an integral part of their identity, and some even characterized their hoarding behavior positively. Consistent with family remember reports in Tolan et al., however, most relatives found the hoarding, behavior, hoarding person's behavior problematic. That is as naked as you want, right? I mean, you take that passage, take out hoarder, and put homosexual in, and you're back in psychiatry in, in 1954. It's exactly the same logic, right? And it's the families that are upset. Put simply, hoarders like what they do, or at least they don't see what's wrong with it. 
For their families and communities, however, it's another story. There's some good research on family and commu community intervention into hoarding behavior, but none that I know of that focuses on why exactly families suffer from the lifestyle of their hoarders. The silence may be entirely unperplexing to non-hoarders. It's dangerous, it's disgusting, it gets in the way of more valuable uses of time and energy. It's obviously problematic. And I don't stand before you to deny that, but I do stand before you to deny that that is a medical diagnosis. It's instead an expression of social unease. And um, I don't mean to suggest there's nothing for families and communities to be uneasy about, but it's at the next moment in the career of this unease that I stage my defense where self-reflection on the nature of that unease might occur, families and communities instead shield themselves from the need to explore it by identifying the hoarder as sick. Doctor, they say, we've done all we can to stop her. Can't you do something? The hoarder is thereby expelled from the space of family and community reasons into the space of psychiatry. And the hoarders themselves, however positive their attitude toward their behavior, they submit themselves to treatment, the lack of cogent diagnosis notwithstanding, because they don't want their families and communities to suffer. The hoarder becomes ill on behalf of others. It's here that the defenders of the hoarder have to take their stand. Now, can I just, one, I've only got a, less than a page left here, but I just have to say, you know, it's important to acknowledge that there are cases in which families and communities do need to protect themselves as well as protecting their hoarders from the consequences of hoarding behavior. Nothing I'm saying denies that. Langley Collier, the, the dedicated hoarder of the famous Collier Brothers. People know the Collier Brothers? You can visit Collier Brothers Park. It's 128th and 5th. The city tore it down because they Actually, by the time they were dead, they couldn't clear it out. There was no way to do it. So it's like the last scene in Carrie. It's just the whole house was caved in. And there's a pocket park now. Um, so Langley Collier stockpiled machinery inside his house with which he tried to generate his own electricity, thus creating a fire hazard. Food and animal hordes often become health hazards. But it's only by a kind of primitive logic of contagion that the diseases caused by some hordes would lead us to judge the hoarders themselves to be diseased. It may be, however, exactly this sort of primitive logic that's at work when families and communities expel their hoarders from the space of what I'm calling family and community reasons. Now, the expulsion of hoarders into treatment looks a lot like the traditional moral practice of shaming. Shaming, however, by which, I, by which I mean subjecting a transgressor to public disgrace. Shaming as a practice assumes that the norms, that norms and a sense for what violates them are shared by transgressors and enforcers alike. Expulsion by shaming assumes that the transgressors fail to live up to obligations that, can be led, that they can be led to remember are their own. Shaming makes sense as a practice then only if the transgressor is kept within the space of family and community reasons. However, to acknowledge that hoarding is egocentonic, this is, I think, the hard nut. To acknowledge that hoarding is egocentonic implies that the hoarder is already outside of that space of reasons. That's not something we do. We might simply say at that point what is plainly true that they are beyond shame, right? I don't have to go back to those pictures to make that point, that they're beyond shame. And on that basis to treat them as the public health policy equivalent of moral monsters. It's the function of psychiatry to defend us against having to draw that inference. And if that's the case, it's not the hoarders, but the rest of us who need doctoring. Here, here then I come to my praise of hoarders. As I argued before, hoarders have broken apart the two meanings of consuming. 
They amass their hordes by pulling goods out of the horde that swamps the world. I almost said our world, but if one tries to see the world of goods in its sublime, in its sublime totality, it becomes clear that it cannot be judged by any human measure. This is a photograph by Andreas Gursky. Right, and, and it's a remarkable photograph. It's, it's, um, it's artificial, it's Photoshop generated. Um, but all he did was reproduce the same image over and over and over again. Um, if one tries to see the world of goods in its sublime totality, it becomes clear that it cannot be judged by any human measure. It's in the nature of consumer capitalist production that goods be mass produced and that their meaning, call it their desirability, be as generically legible as possible. That there are many copies of the newspaper may be irrelevant from the point of view of the text that newspapers bear, but the multiplicity is itself a fundamental fact of capitalist life. Robert Brenner argues further that it's intrinsic to consumer capitalism that goods are not merely simply mass produced, but over produced. We cannot in short consume all the stuff we make. For Brenner, the world must periodically be cleared of the hoard of goods that we create through radical methods of discarding, such as war and economic depression. However, one needn't follow Brenner's turn to political economy, I don't object to it, but one needn't follow that turn to see the problem. Um, Martin Paul Eve, professor of literature, technology, and publishing at Birkbeck University of London, has recently demonstrated, by the way, and this got attention in the Chronicle of Higher Education today, it's an extraordinary study. He's, he's recently demonstrated that the DOI system, uh, uh, okay, digital object identification, digital object identifier, right? Yeah, that the DOI system for the archiving of scholarly publications is losing track of thousands of articles per year. Stuff, sorry, this is, I'm looking at you, this is even worse than bibliomania, right? <laughs> My stuff. <laughs> Through a sheer indifference that is perhaps indistinguishable from malice, our society is built on the heedless and limitless waste of the goods we have made for ourselves. What is required of us to look away from this catastrophe is a topic for another day. But whatever is required of us, the hoarder will or cannot do it. For the hoarder, everything there is, is good for something. If not now, then in the future. It therefore needs to be saved. That the only way to save it is to take it out of circulation is of course, a mistake. That's what the collector does based on judgments of quality and rarity that perforce exclude most of the stuff. That's why hoarders are not collectors. Recall by contrast, the bibliomaniac Sir Thomas Phillips. He wanted to save a copy of every book ever written. But if all the books are valuable, if all the books are valuable, then we need a social institution to save them. Well, call them libraries then we need a social institution to save them. That we do not and perhaps cannot have institutions of production and preservation that embody our commitment to the future, that we've chosen an anarchy of stuff instead, is our social project. The hoarder mistakes this social project for an individual project. That way lies a kind of madness. And for that, we owe the hoarder not merely a defense, but praise. I loved your talk so oh, much. Thank you. So thank you for that. Um, I have lots of thoughts and lots of questions. I'm I'm trying to hone it as much as I can. So bear with me. Um, so I'm I'm definitely sympathetic to, and I would endorse the idea of interrogating our uneasiness towards the the condition of hoarding. Um, mental disorders are value laden. I think a lot of people know this and uh, that's why they've kind of grown and be, you know, taken on a life of their own. Um, 
your talk made me think about the work of Lisa Bortolotti and Rosa Ritunano, um, where they specifically explore how delusions can give meaning um, and how they can be adaptive in a sense that they ground individuals who are in distress. And maybe we can we can validate that condition, um, but they still want to recognize it as some problem that needs to be treated. And maybe there is a, their work is hoping to also offer some protection from the psychi psychiatrist and the over-medicalizing, but there's still this hope that, okay, we can validate this, but we still want to treat it. So, I mean, I'm curious what, if, if hoarding is not a disorder, maybe it's not really a disorder, maybe it's a symptom, um, but I want to know what you think the practical implications of your argument are. Like, what do we, maybe we shouldn't be so uneasy about hoarding, but should we treat it? Do we leave it alone? What do we do? Because I, I think that it is something that we need to help people with because um, even if they don't find distress in it, it can just dis be disruptive to their lives. Yeah. Um, thank you for the question. Um, and, and, you know, there, there are either there are two questions in there or uh, two parts of my answer. Um, I think there are some, not by any means all, but there are some um, conditions that are not medical conditions at all. Um, I think hoarding might be one of them. And I made a gesture, didn't talk about it at all, to some of the interesting literature on um, family and community intervention. Um, most of that literature, not surprisingly, is by psychologists, not by psychiatrists, by psychologists. Um, and what the literature is about is helping communities and families to deal with, talk to, help their hoarders. So that literature is in, in some measure about trying to demedicalize, right? It may be led by medical experts, but it's an effort to demedicalize the phenomenon and treat it as a phenomenon that is in some sense, like what you said about delusions, at home in the conditions out of which they arise, right? So, you know, I, it, may, it may be that hoarding is a little bit more like hysteria than it is like paranoia. This is up for debate, but I just want to say that is the, the first part. Um, this, the second part, I guess it's entailed or, or implied by what I just said, is it kind of depends on what you mean by treatment, right? Um, there are lots of, let's call it disorder. I, it's an old fashioned concept, but there are lots of disordered states of the soul, which are um, central parts of the identity of people for whom that disorder is part of the state of their soul. And that means Life may be more difficult. Social relationships might be more difficult. Careers might be more difficult. But it doesn't follow from that that what's called for is what comes under the heading of treatment. Right? So I don't I don't want to no part of my brief to argue that this isn't a disorder. In fact, I end on that that note that there's a kind of madness here, but I'd still want to know more before I'd be willing to see the order submitted to treatment. Is that no right answer for, okay. Great. Thank you, Greg, that was really brilliant. And you, as I told you personally, realized your promise as an undergraduate or more than surpassed it. <laughs> um, I also thought of a clever subtitle for your talk. Commodity fetishism? Right. I, <laughs> or you already thought of it. Well, I, 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 I didn't include it in here, but I have that yeah, thought. I sure. would have thought so. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of obvious. Uh, from, anyway, 
my question, though, is a kind of disagreement about the radical egalitarianism, uh, because it's only with respect to things. And if they lived alone, if they, which I guess a lot of them do, whether by their own choice or because people leave them, mm -hmm. um, maybe what you said would be convincing. But for people who live together with other people, I don't think they're being radically egalitarian with respect to these others. Because I think you could argue that people need um, space and that in living together with people, there should be at least some cooperative agreement with respect to the use of the space. I think we need to feel at home in our world and at home in our homes in that sense of having a relation to um, openness and the ability to move around. So um, I just want to know what you yeah. think about yeah. that challenge to your yeah. view that it's very narrowly focused on the individual. Mm -hmm. So so thanks for the, the question. And, and I, 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 it, I, I mean, I promised Michael I'd be brief, and I know we're having dinner tonight, so we can follow up on this more. But, um, you know, when, 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 when I when I dropped that radical egalitarianism concept into the talk, I, I dropped it in at a moment when I said, um, I don't have a, a concept. I don't think we have a concept for apprehending a kind of egalitarianism that is indifferent to human need, right? This, and this is a problem. So what, what I think um, from what I've read, what hoarders are lacking in is what you might call any sense of mutuality or reciprocity. I don't think that makes them non-egalitarian. They are equal opportunity, non-reciprocal, non-mutual oriented people. And so there's still a kind of egalitarianism, which is oriented toward, which put it this way, um, people for whom the needs of future people, unimagined future people, are no less pressing. And in some slightly deranged way, more pressing than the needs of people present right now. So they might accuse you wanting more mutuality and reciprocity with the folks who are actually living with me. They might accuse you of being anti-egalitarian. Why should they matter more than future needful people? I'm not, I'm, I'm just trying to press this argument as far as it will go. Uh, uh, wonderful talk. I want to say that. A wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about class. But to do that, I have to introduce my mother, recently deceased, who was, according to most of your criteria, a hoarder, her excellence. In praise of my mother, after her death, she left about 500,000 pounds of belongings to cancer research. So in praise of my mother, she did that. Was that weight or value? Uh, value. Okay. They, the the okay. stuff we had to get rid of. <laughs> but there's a, I want, um, my mother, contrary to your own diagnosis, one thing you said, um, purchased unbelievable amounts of things every day, over and over again. But she hid everything. And the idea of hiding in full display requires an explanation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She didn't want to show it, she wanted to hide it. And we always thought it was because of the guilt of the purchase, the resentment that she possessed it, all kinds of diagnosis we had for her. But one day I called her up and I said, why is it that you keep buying? And here I need to introduce a concept to you, Greg, which is called sustaining loss. I don't know if it could be of use to you. Have you ever heard maybe, of in, it? The, maybe, maybe. In, the, in the future. Maybe, sustaining loss. My mother was born to an extremely impoverished immigrant Jewish family in London. She lost absolutely everything during the war. Every possession, their house was bombed. They lived in the subway. They had nothing. And she said to me, I buy every day or I hoard stuff because it proves that I'm no longer living in poverty. 
She said, it's my way of overcoming the fact that I had nothing. And it means that I've raised myself to a different class. I hoard, I purchase, I consume because I can in a way that I couldn't. So I want to ask you how class comes into this for those people who were born extremely poor, who suddenly have the money to buy, um, and how it becomes a way of sustaining yeah. loss, yeah. which maybe is a useful concept to you. Yeah. Um, so, and it, thanks. It's it's an interesting question, um, and let me just say two things. One is is something about the anecdote. Um, it 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 it. Um, those of us who are old enough to have parents or grandparents who grew up in the nineteen thirties, right, remember things like saving every scrap of tin foil, right, things things like that. Right, the fear of impending shortage. And um, that seems to me not directly connected to questions of class, but a broader loss, a broader cultural experience of loss. Right. So it's not directly key to class. It might be in the case of in her case, it was, yeah. Um, but the, the other thing is that there is a um an element of um, something that remains unexplained, and it was there even in the way you framed it, that um, you would think that if a person now had enough money to buy and hoard all of this stuff, that the need to buy and hoard would recede. Right, I can buy tomorrow, or the day after, or the day after. There's a kind of uh, a kind of bet against the future, not against the past, that the buying in the moment seems to me to exhibit. And I'm not saying that that has nothing to do with the experience of radical deprivation in the past, but the form that the bet takes is not about not wanting. To experience that loss again. She said she wanted to celebrate every single day the fact that she had become middle class, actually. That's the way yeah. she would put it, that she had the money to buy it, so she bought it. Yeah. And and as I say, the, and the thing, the thing about the hoarders, I mean, it's quite fascinating. The ones who not all buy, by the way. There are plenty who just scavenge. Yes. But the, the the ones who buy, it's really it's quite fascinating. You know, there there are people with hundreds and hundreds of sets of bed sheets. I didn't just make that example up. And um, if if you want a way to get broke again, this is in fact one of the things that sometimes does bring orders into treatment, is they maxed out their credit cards, they got the collection agencies at their door. So something has gone wrong in their lives. But what they've done is they've impoverished themselves. They haven't guaranteed. Uh, any kind of protection against impoverishment, right? This is why I'm calling it a bet against the future. Even if everything disappears, I've still got a thousand sets of bed sheets. I will never be that deprived again. It's a funny bet. Yeah. We're in the back here. Hello. Thank Hello. you for the talk. Um, my question was, I think there are other conditions that are ego syntonic. So like narcissism, psychopathy, is it an implication of your argument that these should also not be considered mental disorders? That's an interesting question. Um, thank you. So I have to back up a little bit mm -hmm. for, for this. Um, Let, let me, sorry, thank you. Let me start with narcissism for a second, okay? Because it's it's hard for me to characterize, and you mean um, um, psychopathological narcissism, right? It's hard for me to see that as ego syntonic. That is, the narcissist doesn't affirm the value of the narcissism. The narcissist denies the narcissism. 
So it's not that the narcissism is egocentric, it's that the, the um, cognitive and affective structure of the narcissism is such that, let's call it counter evidence, is unavailable. Were counter evidence available, it would cease to be egocentric immediately. So there may be, and I, I'm going to think about this more. It may be that um, you know there's a whole clinical literature on treating narcissists, which has to do with the fact that they cannot recognize the otherness of the therapist who's in the room with them. And so what they have to be brought to see, that makes it sound sort of orthopedic, but what they have to be brought to see is that there's something not egocentric that's invisible to them. So to call it egocentric is not just to say it makes me happy. It's to say that it's, as one of the clinicians says, an aspect of my identity that brings value to my life. And I think in the case of narcissism, I think that's not affirmed. But it's an interesting question. I want to, I mean, it, certainly I have to say more about what I mean by egocentric to make that response to you stick in any meaningful way. Thank you. Hi, I want to press on um, the way you responded uh, to the claim that the narcissists see value primarily in things. You said that they are oh, the hoarder. It, the hoarder. Sorry, the hoarder. The you said that they are indifferent to um, the value of human beings. Is that correct? I wonder if the Collier's Collier brothers case is a counterexample to this. So the, the Collier brothers seclusion, as I understand, and I only know this because I live around the street from the park. Okay. So I've read the placard and <laughs> so it's, lo stuff it's, lo it's local yeah. legend. Yeah. Um, they started to do this because of the demographic changes in the neighborhood. So clearly they placed negative values on certain kinds of people. Um, and another thing that precipitated the secluded, um, uh, their seclusion was that one of the brothers went blind. And I think it was Homer, it was Homer. and Langley had to stay home and care for him. So there was a value placed upon them. I just thought- Them being, well, in that case, the them is Homer. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm, let me say something, but tell me if I haven't understood the force of the question. Um, one, of, one of the, um, yeah, I'll start here, but it's not a direct answer. One, one of the odd things about the Langley brothers is, as you say, Homer went blind, and I mean, the Collier brothers, and Langley took care of him. How did Langley take care of his blind brother? By filling the house with stuff so that it was almost impossible for Homer to get around. Right? Some, if somebody were visually impaired, care for them wouldn't come out as, let me put as many obstacles in the way of their mobility as I can. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and, and in fact, the, um, the, 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 the deaths, which were very sad, Langley died because a stack collapsed on him. He, when, and, and then 10 days later, Homer died of starvation. And it was Homer's death that brought the authorities in. And at first, because they couldn't find Langley, at first they thought Langley had somehow killed Homer and then left. It took them another couple of weeks to find his body elsewhere, right? So um, it, it, it's hard for me to apprehend that as care or mutuality, right? Um, isn't to deny that somewhere in the in the in the um, genesis of this condition, there was care, and no doubt Homer and Langley were devoted to one another but not in a form that expressed itself as care. Now, the, the other thing though about, you know, they lived in a neighborhood, it was a mansion they lived in. Their father was a very wealthy doctor of some kind. Nobody even knows this story, sorry. Very wealthy doctor 
of some kind. And they retreated when the neighborhood went downhill. Um, but there's retreat and there's retreat, right? But they, what, again, it's Langley, it's not Homer. Homer was a, all things considered, a much more normal fellow. Um, Langley's form of retreat was to cut himself off completely, not just from the people he didn't like, but from the whole world, the story that I hinted at, that he, you know, he brought in, he brought in a, an old car to try to generate his own electricity. And the reason he did that was he was in a decades-long fight with the electric company. Right? I am not going to give those idiots a penny. I'm going to generate my own electricity. So what you get is something like a recognizable either in the case of care for the brother, a kind of mutuality, or in the case of, of the hostility toward the bad elements in the neighborhood, a kind of racism. But what you get out of it is a radical repudiation of the concerns of others at all. And it's that leap. Does that address the question? Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I found this uh, particularly interesting in sort of drawing attention to the social and political causes of certain psychiatric conditions. And um, I think there's some interesting connections with the work of Fanon, who, of course, called, who, who said that colonialism was a fertile purveyor yeah. for the psychiatric hospitals. Yeah. But um, it's not so much a question, but I think there's also a resonance with some work that I've read on body dysmorphic disorder, which is also classified as an OCRD, a, a obsessive compulsive related disorder, which also seems to be a very modern condition mm -hmm. and seems to be, uh, you know, the, the, some of the causes at least seem to be sociogenic or politicogenic, having to do with the sort of obsessive, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, obsession with body image and advertising and stuff like that. And so I guess my question is, have you thought about um, other sorts of psychiatric conditions and the kind of um, possible sociogenic or politicogenic uh, uh, causes for them? Yeah. Um, so the, the thank, thank you for the, the question. Um, there's actually, a, I think a pretty decent literature on the socio and politicogenic um, etiology of things like PTSD, right? It's a pretty large literature on that. Um, and the, the, the thing about the reason I focus on hoarding here is I, I feel a little bit like a, a weird kind of privilege to be at a moment when a concept is taking form, when a concept is gelling, and for the concept to gel as a psychiatric concept, what it has to do is it has to cut its connections to its psychogenic, to its sociogenic and politicogenic origins. So um, Fanon is in the background here, and another figure whom nobody speaks about anymore is in the background is R.D. Lang, right? Um, and just brutal kind of summing up of, of Lang's thought. It was, okay, you're going to try to push them out of the communities? No, we're going to put them back in the communities. This is where the problems came from, and this is where the problems are going to be resolved. Um, I think a, an interesting case of this run, as it were, backwards is the you know the medicalization of homosexuality, which required, um, I mean, you know, there were psychiatrists and psychoanalysts arguing, you know, this is an illness. Of course, it's got background conditions, but it's an illness, and our task is to figure out how to treat it as an illness. And in both, in that case, from within the profession. You had two moves. One was 
there's a sociogenic and politicogenic background to this. In other words, we suffer not because we're sick, but because others think we are, right? So the, the sociogenic and, and politicogenic background is the background to the entire um, apparatus of illness making and illness refusing. You look like you have a follow up. Well, uh, it was just that um, on on the issue of body dysmorphic disorder, there's a similar, I think, conflation of it as a as a, as a compulsive, um, and and part of the tip off that why it's not it shouldn't be uh, lumped together with uh, with OCD is it's also uh, ego symptomatic. Right. It's not ego symptomatic. Right. I mean, I think that poses more problems with living than hoarding. But uh, interesting. Interesting. But it's in the same yeah. same category. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I think with that, we are out of time, but thank you so much for the talk and the Q and A.